Welcome to Reporter's Notebook, where we talk to the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the stories that are breaking on their beats. I'm Jim Antle, and I'm here today with energy reporter Josh Siegel. Josh, you have a new podcast out where you talk to Senator Shelley Moore Capito, West Virginia Republican, and she believes that there might be a way Democrats can get her West Virginia colleague, Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat who's arguably the most important member of the Senate to go along with their agenda on climate that is part of the reconciliation bill. What, could you lay that out for us a little bit? Yeah, of course. So yeah, this is really interesting to me. You know, S Senator Shelley Moore Capito is, is, is opposed to obviously what the Democrats are doing in reconciliation. And, and Joe Manchin, he hasn't, he hasn't said much, um, but, but when he has, he's basically said, I, look, I'm pretty skeptical of what's called the clean electricity payment program or performance program, uh, which essentially would provide federal government grants to utilities uh, to that uh, generate more of their electricity from zero carbon sources. So that's wind and solar, nuclear, uh, things like that. And at the same time, penalizing utilities that aren't meeting certain targets. So yeah, I mean, Joe Manchin, again, he hasn't said a ton, but he, he has uh, you know, made clear that he, he's, he's pretty skeptical. He thinks that the utility sector is, the electricity sector is already, you know, doing a transition and that there's no need to, for the federal government to, to get involved. So, but, you know, Senator Capito told us, no, like there might, there might be a way if essentially they design the program so that carbon capture technology, which is something that Republicans and, and moderate uh, Democrats from fossil fuel states are very supportive of, essentially, you would be able to attach this to a fossil fuel plant, be it coal or natural gas, and it would stop the emissions from actually entering the atmosphere. Now, this technology is not widely available. It's, it's expensive at this point. It's not very commercialized. Uh, but essentially, if you could count that technology as clean, perhaps that's a way Joe Manchin can go back to his constituents and say, look, coal and gas will not be entirely eliminated as part of this program. So the Department of Energy is now estimating that households that rely on natural gas for their home heating needs could face uh, bill increases, should, could see their bills rise on average by about 30% this winter. Talk us through a little bit about what kind of impact that might have. Yeah, so we've kind of, you know, people and businesses have grown, I think, very accustomed to the fact that, you know, the U.S. for over a decade has had very low natural gas prices. And, and the natural gas prices, this is separate from, you know, gasoline prices, what you pay at the pump. I mean, natural gas prices aren't visible, but, but what makes it relevant to consumers is that natural gas has become our most used electricity source, and it's used in home heating by about half of households in the U.S. as the as the fuel that is is doing the home heating. So yeah, we've had very low prices for a long time, and that's been because of the shale boom. We we've had all this supply at our at our fingertips, and there just hasn't been a question. Uh, but what's happening? We've had turmoil, you know, across energy markets right now, and it's it's really outside of you know any particular politician or you know policies control. It's just what's been going on with demand. Uh, you know, with the economy revving back up from the pandemic, we've just, there's just hasn't been enough supply to, to make up for it. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, consumers aren't going to really care about the cause, but yes, I mean, you, you could see, you know, you know for, again, it's not super visible for everybody, but I mean, we're talking about potentially you know, an increase of, of over, you know, a hundred dollars uh, in the course of a winter on your, you know, heating bill. That's pretty significant for a lot of people. So, Individual politicians may not have a lot to do with what is going on in this area, but this could actually have a major impact and effect on individual politicians, particularly when you're looking at the energy crunch, when you're looking at inflation in other sectors of the economy, when you're looking at global supply chain issues. What kind of influence could this have on President Biden's climate agenda? Yeah, no, it's it's very interesting, and the timing is super interesting because President Biden uh, confirmed uh, just recently that he he is attending the uh, big UN United Nations Climate Summit here coming up in, in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, it'll be starting October thirty first 
he'll be there for the few, first few days. And this, this is kind of seen as the moment where countries are expected to increase their uh, emissions reduction commitments as part of the Paris Agreement um, that President Trump famously pulled the U.S. from. Biden put, it, put the U.S. back in. And, and this is kind of seen as the moment, yeah, when everyone comes together and really puts the, the, the foot on the gas pedal. And it's just, it's just, it's tricky to, to kind of make the case for that when, you know, climate has always been this issue. I think it's changing somewhat with the extreme weather we've seen this summer, but it is an issue that isn't as salient as just everyday energy spending and, and, and what you experience, you know, day to day. So, uh, you know, when you're dealing with these rising costs and people are feeling that, I think it just kind of raises to the fore that, look, any transition to green energy, to wind, solar, a, a system predominantly powered by those is going to involve costs. It's going to be, um, you know, yes, there's policies that can offset it somewhat, but th there will be costs involved. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it makes it very tricky for Biden. And it's something he's sensitive to. He's, he actually you know, is calling oil, his administration, not him personally, but they're talking to oil companies and saying, what, what, could, what could you do to help us deal with this current predicament? And to, you know, climate activists who are saying, oh, you're calling up, you know, the oil and gas companies to help you produce more fossil fuels at the same time right. as you're wanting to move aggressively on climate. It's, it's a very tricky predicament. Right. He's essentially asking for these companies help in keeping prices low at the same time he's imposing or proposing to impose a lot of regulations and other policies that they don't really like. Yeah, no, exactly. Again, and, 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 and as I said, I mean, in this current moment, we haven't seen any particular policy. I mean, none of Biden's policies have, have been, I mean, he hasn't put forth any regulations that are finalized. He hasn't really done anything beyond pausing oil and gas leasing on federal lands, which has been, you know, rescinded by a federal judge. And so, the, 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 you know, there's nothing in particular there, but it's the specter of, I mean, the industry is clearly using this as, look, we, you know, if you do these policies, I mean, there's more to come. If you impose, you know, a fee on methane, if you really do try to make it harder to produce oil and gas on federal lands more long-term, you're going to see more of these challenges going forward. So you're seeing industry kind of use this as an impetus to say, hey, Democrats, what you're doing in reconciliation were, you know, would be a bad idea. And so as energy becomes a pocketbook issue again, how, what, what impact does, does that have on the political appetite for things like carbon pricing as a part of, of a climate package? Yeah, you know, I, I think, I mean, Democrats I talk to are, are very aware of, of the potential uh, challenge in trying to do something like this in the current moment. But I also think there's a sense that they feel like it's a, it's a, it's a you know, this is the opportunity. But Democrats are not assured that they're going to have full control of Washington uh, for for much longer. And right. you know, the science is saying that by 2030, you re the U.S. really and the world really has to be on a path to net zero emissions. You know, maybe 50 percent um, reductions by then. So they're they're saying, look, I mean, th th this current moment is tricky, but world energy markets are unpredictable. We could be in. A, I mean. During the start of the pandemic, we were in rock bottom prices, and, and this was a totally different conversation. So it's it's hard to predict, um, you know, how, what 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 it looks like, you know, when voting happens. But uh, it's, they're clearly very sensitive to it. Uh, but I think they're determined to get their their policy agenda through. A lot needs to get done in a relatively short period of time. Thank you, Josh. You can read Josh and the rest of the Energy Team's coverage at DailyOnEnergy.com.